Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a fireside chat on uh, India's path to open RAN development and deployment. Um, we have with us Mr. Ajay Nijhawan from Intel. And very shortly, I'm going to introduce him in more detail. So what is the fireside chat today about? The, the telecom industry, as we know it, is increasingly considering ways to accelerate network deployments you know, through new and cost-effective methods of deploying and effectively managing networks. The RAN architecture has been opened in standardization for some time, but de facto interpretation and missing pieces have raised the stakes in the entry barriers. Open RAN, uh, as we know it, has emerged as a promising path to lower that entry barrier by adopting an open technology model. This evolution of wireless communication standards from 4G to 5G denotes a new benchmark for spectrum efficiency, latency, coverage, capacity by utilizing advanced modulation methods, algorithms, uh, processing capacity, and more. Now, this open RAN architecture helps operators achieving significant operational gains with its non-proprietary communication interfaces among RAN, RAN components. So today in the fireside chat, we would be speaking with Mr. Nijhawan, uh, who is the head of network and communication segment of Intel India, on some of the recent developments in Open RAN and where do we go from here. A brief about um, Ajay is that Ajay, while being the head of network and communication segment for India at Intel, he has spent many years in the communication industry and has deep understanding of telecom, cloud, enterprise, and network segments. In his current role at Intel, Ajay is helping building a data-centric world, accelerating the network transformation and building global partnerships that enable cloud edge, AI, and network evolution. So a, a very good afternoon to you, Ajay. Happy to have you here. Uh, good afternoon, Dipayan. And thank you for inviting me to, uh, to the discussion. It's really a pleasure and honor for me to be here. Thank you so much. So, you know, while, uh, while we, we start with this, um, a topic which is uh, very close to your heart, uh, we wanted to start with, uh, you know, through your various interactions with telecom and technology players on this subject, uh, what do you see as some of the key benefits that telcos can expect from implementing an open RAN architecture? And how is the supply chain evolving to cater to it? Okay, uh, so see the fine, I think the adoption of open radio access network, also known as ORAN, brings new benefits and challenges to the mobile operators. As most of us are aware that ORAN is a disaggregated architecture moving away from close appliance RAN implementation. The open front hall from ORAN decouples radio units from the baseband. Uh, so the ORAN deployments, I would say, are like broken down into functional elements like radio unit, distributed unit, and central unit. Operators can locate these functions independently where needed to adapt to the changing demands on their network while optimizing the deployment and the management cost. Beyond uh, 3GPP standard disaggregation, ORAN Alliance also promotes cloudification of the RAN software and adoption of uh, containerized network functions. So as a result of these, uh, I'll say, open RAN evolution, the new open interfaces have emerged uh, that have enabled interoperability uh, across vendors, uh, which has expanded the ecosystem of solution providers, uh, you know, which an operator can deploy, and has increased the speed to the market of these new services. With all these changes, uh, the mobile operators, you know, can now choose the best infrastructure, they can choose the best platform, and they can choose the best functional elements, each independent of the other. Uh, so the openness and the open source promotion from the alliance and community will bring the cost down. Further, it is bringing much needed software driven cloud automation and orchestration based agility, uh, elasticity, scalability, multi tenancy and multi-vendor adoption, thereby fastening the network function of uh, innovation in the RAN space. 
I'll say last but not the least uh, here, the, you know, with near real time and non real time rig functions, uh, will you know these will help in, in uh, network slicing, and they'll also help in AI ML resource allocation, uh, base resource allocation, and policy for traffic steering in the RAN architecture. So to summarize the first part, I'll say uh, in a nutshell, ORAN brings in agility, elasticity, uh, scalability flexibility at redu reduced cost for the operators. Uh, moving on to the second part of the supply chain. Uh, so I'll say Open RAN has widened the spectrum of category categories of ecosystem partners, and each category is bringing in their expert expertise to the table to complete the end-to-end -end offer for the radio access network. Uh, we have hyperscalers, system integrators, AI developers, uh, uh, you know, new, uh, I would say, RAN providers, which, you know, we, we, we call them as ISVs, as independent software vendors. Uh, they, they are OEMs and ODMs who are all uh, participating in this. On the supply chain for hardware, uh, there are mainly two parts. Uh, one is the baseband and the second is the radio. For baseband, you know, the COT servers will be deployed for over, uh, ORAN. Uh, there's a global supply chain available from OEMs like HP, Dell, Supermicro, and many new ODMs, uh, you know, coming up from Taiwan, like MyTAC. This is a multi-billion multi dollar industry to tap into. The industry is a pro pure play server industry, which is delivering servers to everyone, uh, just not telecom operators. And there exists a large supply chain, uh, you know, for these servers, uh, for, for uh, the baseband portion, or, you know, you may call it a distributed unit. On the radio side, the disaggregation is leading to new supply chain for radios. And it is important to look for diversity uh, of supply. The radio chain supply is complex with hundreds of components going in a radio. So relying on one vendor will be more risky uh, than having multiple choices for radio. So I, I'll say, you know, the supply chain spectrum is expected to improve the reliability uh, by virtue of more options, which will benefit operators. Uh, one other aspect is, uh, you know, uh, there is an opportunity for open RAN in India to use more local supply. The Indian government Make in India program and PLI initiative for electronic industry will help in bringing both the server and the radio manufacturing to India with many OEMs and ODMs planning to serve the demand locally. I'll say at Intel, we are actively working with the Indian telecom industry uh, to build TCO optimized solutions for 5G and 4G ORAN across micro to small cells. We are engaged with Indian, uh, you know, leading Indian operators, as well as with server OEMs and ODMs to develop more and more sophisticated dev designs supporting extreme environment conditions for outdoor deployments and various form factors. And also for volume production, you know, it's trending towards cost optimized, fully integrated chip down designs to bring down the TCO. All these solutions are, you know, uh, kind of powered by latest third generation Xeon scalable processors, Intel FPGAs, ESX, uh, time sync Ethernet cards, and uh, uh, leveraging Intel Frexran uh, software reference architecture. So we have been enabling, uh, I'll say, multiple ecosystem partners in India to build 5G solutions locally by collaborating with them on both hardware and software size. So to summarize the second part, I'll say, I, I think we will have multiple category of ecosystem partners. We're going to have global pairs with many of them establishing manufacturing setup in India and many new local Indian players as well. And Intel is working with the entire uh, Indian telecom industry across the telecom operators, ISVs, leading OEMs and local ODMs to accelerate or an adoption. Okay, so, um, so yeah. that's 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 quite um, you know interesting to know. Um, Rakuten Symphony, uh, we here um, teamed up with uh, you know with you and Juniper to develop a product which is aimed at you know easier ORAN deployment and you know 4G and 5G densification and less hardware needed per site. So um, would you like to talk about it a, a, a little bit more for our viewers? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, depend. So I, I think Rakuten, Intel, and Juniper, they have teamed up to develop uh, SimWare. It is a multi-purpose edge appliance for open RAN deployments. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it combines basically, you know, the cell site routing functionality uh, with a distributed unit on a single general purpose server platform uh, running on a cloud native environment. So, uh, you know, this would uh, significantly reduce the hardware needed per site. And, you know, I'll say we, along with it also reduce the operating uh, expenditure for an operator. And like, you know, I think uh, in this alliance, we are bringing in our next generation uh, Xeon D processors and FlexRAN uh, reference software. And this collaboration will showcase uh, how RAN workload can be consolidated onto a single server and meet the performance capacity and cost requirements of 5G RAN deployments. Uh, And I'll say this device is set to be available from Rakuten 6 Symphony in the first half of next year. So that's in brief of, you know, the work which we are, uh, you know, how we are collaborating with Rakuten and uh, Juniper here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but however, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you must have seen a few challenges to an open RAN adoption. Um, yeah. You know, for example, um, at the end of 2020, there were nearly uh, 40 commercial ORAN deployments around the world. Uh, but it is just about one third of the total number of live 5G networks. Um, so in terms of um, these various challenges, do you do you find uh, your clients coming and talk to you, talking to you about um, some of the challenges that um, they ask you to uh, alleviate, uh, especially in terms of brownfield deployments? Sure, yeah, Dipan. I, I think you really captured it well. I think uh, ORAN, I would say, is not a new feature. It is actually network transformation. Uh, mm-hmm. That's what I would say in summary. So, you know, this requires, uh, there is really a new hardware, new software, new vendors, and more importantly, I'll say new ways of operations. So telcos need to really uh, think through not only about, you know, getting to the market, but also, uh, you know, about supporting the solution in the field. And hence, uh, you know, telcos need to revisit the processes and their operation teams need to rethink how they will support this in the field. And the best way for this to happen is to learn from others. Like you just gave example of 40, you know, uh, announcements. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of them have already done it. Others are still on the path. So, you know, so there are, I would say, a bunch of people who have already done it. Uh, so the best way is to really learn from them. And secondly, expose your, new, you know, expose the new technology to uh, your operation teams. Uh, uh, for faster deployments, yeah, I, I think there are pre validated solutions already available from some providers, uh, which is a combination of hardware, software, uh, partners who have, uh, you know, worked together with system integrators. Uh, you know, operators can straight away go and deploy that uh, for faster, you know, deployment. Otherwise, mobile operators will have to conduct pilots and trials to evaluate equipment and solutions from different vendors. Uh, first in standalone manner, and then also conduct exhaustive interoperability test to make sure that there are no uh, deployment issues. Uh, trials will also have to focus on the performance in an end-to-end setup, stitching together different pieces of equipment, uh, like uh, what I mentioned earlier, the DU, RU, and CU. And when conducting trials, uh, I'll say engaging operations team will be important so that they can learn about the new ways of doing and maintaining open RAN. And yeah, uh, other important aspect is definitely system integration. And I think some operators are trying to do it themselves while some operators are finding a system integrator. So the, so the operators have to be honest with their organization capabilities. Uh, I think the key question for them is that can they pull the SI function uh, with their own internal resources or do they need help? And if they need help, uh, then using SI partner will help to manage the integration and introduction of open RAN. Uh, that's and uh, okay. as yeah, as that regards system integrators, I think they should be clear for their role uh, with telcos and solution infra providers. The neutrality and automation are key aspects that SI should consider. And the integration and the operation may happen in extremely varying ecos- uh, you know, ecosystem with solution from one provi- player, cloud stack from second player, infra from the third player, and core from the fourth player. Uh, Intel really comes at the infrastructure layer here, and you know we are working with hardware OEMs, ODMs to bring the best product in the market. Uh, Intel product roadmap is specifically, you know, I, I'll say especially natively aligned to 5G requirements, 
and being a leader here in innovation, Intel understands the needs of different 5G technology requirements, uh, be it low uh, latency, through, uh, throughput, or you know, signal, signaling capacity, etc. Intel as a platform provider offers software-defined infrastructure to entire spectrum of end-to-end -end industry requirements from hardware enablement uh, to native support of cloud security. So um, you lose me. Uh, so I was just no, about I, to we, 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 yeah. we pretty much, uh, you know, we pretty much heard, and I, I think it, it's it's quite insightful of um, the the various aspects that you talked about. That um, you know, um, all the all the people in the value chain, the telecom operators, the infrastructure providers, as well as um, the um, um, you know the other vendors uh, providing various components of the open RAN uh, need to uh, need to take care of. Of um, you know, if I um, I think uh, it was quite an interesting um, discussion today. Um, Unfortunately, we have just uh, neared the the time uh, limit for our fireside chat, and we would need to close it. So, um, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ajay, for for coming over, and um, it was quite insightful talking to you. Pleasure here, Defan. Uh, great talking to you. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye bye. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, here we are on the fireside chat on uh, open RAN deployments. Uh, we all know for the, that for the last four decades, you know, the wireless industry has been on its quest for enhancements in wireless networks and services. The RAN architecture has been opened in standardization for some time, but de facto interpretation and missing pieces have raised the stakes in the entry barriers. This disaggregation of hardware and software with open interfaces, it, it essentially gives mobile operators the flexibility and agility to cooperate with uh, different vendors. And hence, Open RAN is reaching maturity. The total cumulative Open RAN revenue projects is estimated to be around $15 billion between 2020 and 2025, which will act actually account for around 10% of the overall revenues of 25. Uh, with maturity of hardware and software open interfaces, this open RAN is poised for a large scale implementation in macro networks. Multinational operators have incorporated open RAN in their network development plan and are actively testing and deploying the open interface technology to their LTE and 5G NR networks globally. For example, um, Vodafone has deployed open RAN sites in several countries. Telefonica plans to achieve around 50% of the new RAN site deployments based on open RAN between 2022 and 2025. Etisalat, on the other hand, has run a production trial of open RAN for all mobile generations. Now, here in our fireside chat today, we are pleased to have Mr. Matteo Fiorani. He is a PhD and, st and strategic product manager of the product line of Cloud RAN in Ericsson in Sweden. So a warm welcome to you, Matteo. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Thanks. It's, it's great to have you here. So, uh, you know, so how I wanted to start with you is that um, we all know that the Ericsson Cloud RAN, you know, can be deployed across all deployment scenarios, including existing footprints. Now, this uh, has a very nice term coined for it called the blue field deployments. And um, with, with its full inter, interworking between the two network architectures. And uh, what we actually saw that unlike a green field or a brown field, a blue field offer CSPs a seamless evolution towards cloud native tech techs and you know open network architectures. So by when do you expect the open RAN of you know supply to uh, 
you know, come into an inflection point with these blue field deployments? Yeah, thanks. This is an excellent question. So what uh, we see is that uh, the, the situation for many operators today is that they already have a network with different technology like 2G, 3G, 4G, and many are deploying right now also 5G using a purpose-built solution like the traditional round solution. And now they are starting, many of operators are starting to consider also uh, to add open run capabilities on top of their network, but they of course don't want to make a rip and replace of the technology that they already have uh, built into the network and the investment that they have already done. So then the question comes how to best introduce the new open run technologies by still being able to leverage of the investment that the operator has already done on the purpose built solutions. And this is where the blue field type of deployments comes into play. Uh, with blue field, what we can do is that we can introduce an open run network that is fully cloud native, but making it interwork with the existing network in an optimal way, using interfaces between the purpose built run and the new open run network that would enable advanced coordination function to happen in a smoothless, in a very smooth way, so that the user can move around in a open run area and in a purpose bit area without noticing any difference in terms of performance. This includes functionality that are very complex to perform across platforms such as spectrum sharing and um, carrier aggregation. But still, these are very critical to ensure a basically seamless service for the user wherever it goes in the network, independently whether the user is served by open run or a purpose built. And this is the, the beauty of a blue field type of deployment compared to green field and brown field. And is it also productized in the name of Ericsson Cloud Link? That's correct. Ericsson Cloud Link, it's the name that we use to indicate the link between the open run network, the new open run network and the purpose built network. And it's an interface that we have developed specifically for these advanced coordination features so that all the customer can start introducing open run in a smooth way without sacrificing on performance and still leveraging all, all the investment they have done in their purpose built network. Right. So, um, so, so do you do you see these uh, blue field deployments um, also, um, you know, catching attraction in India? Absolutely. I think that would be an excellent way, actually, to introduce uh, the technology in an open run. Of course, uh, in India, since there are the number of sites is extremely high, that the the rollout could start, and uh, in, in many areas could start with using purpose built network, especially. If we look at the technology today, we think that purpose built network are more mature, especially when it comes to DRAM deployment. So if we have some uh, some sites that are distributed, heavily distributed, where there is no transport infrastructure, the purpose built network could still offer probably a best TCO. So maybe the operator would still decide to deploy some purpose built sites, but uh, where they have the possibility, they can start leveraging from open run. That will not be in the entire network, but only in some parts. And that is where the blue field technology and the Ericsson Cloud Link would enable the operator to do this mix of purpose built and open run in a very efficient way and still have full performance across the entire network. That's right. That's right. Um, so that's that's quite quite enthralling. Um, now um, if we if we come into 5G, you know, um, open RAN as we see it is also an essential enabler of 5G. Um, and open network modernization, for example, if you will. Um, now, with the growth of commercial 5G rollouts, Open RAN is actually destined to play a leading role in transforming, you know, the future wireless communication mar market by combining 5G with other advanced technologies, uh, you know, bringing in edge computing, automation, artificial intelligence, to address the new opportunities which you know the private net networks hold now uh, with so many operators also keen to accelerate the pace of open ran deployments um, do you think it will take precedence when it comes to 5g ran will 5g ran be able to catapult the adoption of open ran to a new level yeah, the, the, that is a very good question. So I think that um, the, the first step from an operator is to start introducing 5G as soon as possible because there are so many advantages that come with it. If we look at all the possibilities that 5G offers, it is an amazing innovation platform that can serve both the society, so the user by providing better connectivity, 
uh, but also the industries and the enterprises. So rolling out 5G, it's always the, the key stepping stone. So uh, um, that should be the, the first priority for the operator. And then how to deploy it? There are different options. So before it was only purpose-built was the only solution. But now with Open Run, there is a lot more flexibility for the operator to decide which technology to use depending on the use case. And we see that, for example, in the short to midterm, Open Run would fit very well to specific use cases, like, for example, centralized deployment based on data centers or as some enterprise deployment, some indoor solution. While purpose bit would still keep an advantage for other type of deployments, like for example, distributed run and other type of macro sites. So this could be a mix of open run and purpose build uh, that would benefit as a starting point for the operator. Then going forward, as the open run technologies matures more and more, then the operator can start deploying open run more and uh, replacing the purpose bit network when, when uh, it is applicable. So it could be a smooth migration, but in our view, it's always start, everything starts with 5G deployments and then Open Run could tie into uh, the 5G deployment. Right, now, right. Uh, given, um, given these considerations, right, um, what would you like, you know, to talk about, um, you know, some of the key security issues, especially in terms of cybersecurity um, and, uh, you know, some of the challenges that are seen um, towards adoption of open RAN architecture and how should we go about it? Yeah, yes, the security aspect is critical for open RAN and it's something, it is an area that is getting right now a lot of focus. So, the, the key issue that happens in terms of security with open RAN is that now we disaggregate the RAN in multiple pieces and each of these pieces are connected through open interfaces. Uh, what we what happens when we do this is that we expand the attack uh, um, uh, surface, meaning that uh, a malicious entity could have more open interfaces and more different network nodes that it can attack. So we need to make sure when we deploy the operand that all the network nodes, all the interfaces are properly secured. Uh, mm -hmm. If we look at the open run standards, how they were defined at the beginning, security was not really the main focus. There was mostly focus on defining the architecture, how to enable interoperability and all these different aspects. But now it they became more and more evident, for example, if we take standardization body like the Oral Alliance, they have realized that securities are also fundamental. That's why they have added uh, new groups like the security focus groups in the Oral Alliance that are specifically targeting addition of security function to the different open run network nodes and uh, interfaces. And this work is currently ongoing and there is a lot of, uh, pays a lot of attention into this. Uh, it would be a journey. It would take some time. I think that uh, a lot has already been done during the past year, but it would take still some time to reach the same level of maturity in terms of security protocols as existing network that have been out in the field for many years and resisted already many attacks. So there is a huge potential in terms of what uh, Open Run can offer in terms of security, but it's a, it will be a journey and will take some time for Open Run to get there. Perfect, perfect. Um, and while um, you know, uh, from from India, if I if I may ask you that, um, what would you advise, um, if you will, uh, our Indian operators to keep in mind the key aspects when looking at an efficient deployment of Open RAN. Yes, the, the, that is. There, there are some aspects that are extremely important. Security, it's uh, pivotal, and that we already mentioned. Other important aspects are, are, for example, how to enable the uh, integration of all the different components. Since we have different pieces, so if we look at cloud, for example, we don't have a unique uh, block with hardware and software integrated that we used to have before. And now mm -hmm. we have different pieces. We have the hardware, we have the cloud platform, we have the software the integration of all these pieces becomes critical and the operator needs to take a bigger role into ensuring that all the different pieces that could potentially come from different vendors can work efficiently together. And this could be complicated at the beginning because there are a lot of things that needs to be learned. It's true that cloud is mature like in other areas like the core network, but for the radio access network is relatively new. And there are many things that for the radio access network are quite special. So the radio access network is very real time compared to core network. So it's very important that the operator understands all the requirements that come from the radio access network and all the challenges with the integration of the hardware, the cloud platform and the software. The operator needs to somehow take a bigger role into the actual design and development of the network when it comes to open run with respect to before when they were just buying the solution out of the box from the vendor. 
Perfect. Uh, Matthew, so uh, we are just uh, towards the um, end of the uh, time for the for the chat. Uh, uh, however, um, you know, um, it was it was quite awesome speaking to you. And, uh, you know, we hope that Ericsson continues to play an active role in shaping the specifications. Um, also, in your role as a part of the ORAN Alliance, you know, um, uh, propagating the capabilities and uh, making the operators learn um, on an efficient deployment of a cloud RAN. So um, all the best to you, and thank you so much for joining today. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, this is an open RAN panel that uh, we are initiating today. Um, as we all know, the, the telecom industry is increasingly considering ways to accelerate network deployments through new and cost-effective methods um, of deploying and effectively managing networks. The radio access networks accounts for around 70% of APEX, OPEX of mobile networks. And so a lot of focus is there to reduce RAN costs. Specifically, 5G signals have a shorter range than, than previous generation signals. So as a result, 5G networks require more base stations to provide the required coverage. So in 5G networks, all the more, this percentage may be still higher. Now, this is where the concept of an open virtualized radio access network architecture becomes critical. Uh, open RAN or open radio access networks refers to a new paradigm where cellular radio networks are comprised of hardware and software components from multiple vendors operating over network interfaces that are truly open and interoperable. An open environment expands the ecosystem and with more vendors providing the building blocks, uh, there is more innovation and more options for the operators. They can also add new services. However, there are a few challenges to an open RAN adoption. For example, at the end of 2020, there were nearly 40 commercial ORAN deployments around the world, which is just about one third of the total number of live 5G networks. Now, these challenges actually amount to something like managing issues in the multi-vendor environment, which necessit necessitates a standardization, Brownfield de de deployments where the open RAN needs to synchronize effectively with current deployed infrastructure or with the legacy 4G equipment in the network and different user equipment. With this premise, our session today aims at discussing some of these pressing questions with regards to open RAN in the industry around cybersecurity concerns, network performance, uh, the inflection point of open RAN deployment, how do we manage the multi-vendors, and the ownership of the overall uh, development, if you will. So as we start, let me introduce our panelists today. Um, today we are joined um, you know, by our esteemed speakers, and I start with uh, Srimati Deepa Tyagi, uh, who is the Senior DDG and Head of Telecommunication Engineering Center. We have Mr. Abhishek Shukla, Head of Sales, MFG Conglomerates and Telco Business of Red Hat. Mr. Saurav Tiwari, Director and Chief Technology Officer of Dell Technologies. Mr. Radhakant Das, Industry Advisor and Chief Architect, Tata Consultancy Services. Mr. Amar Mangyan, Senior Director, Technical Sales, Mobility Solutions of Asia Pacific in Comscope. Dr. Robert Pepper, Head Global Connectivity Policy and Planning of Meta Platforms. Mr. Nilesh Dhopte, Senior Vice President in Reliance Geo. And Mr. Rajesh Singh, EVP Network Planning and Strategy of Vodafone Idea Limited. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining with us today. Now, as we start, we, I would like to start with TEC. And ma'am, we all know that TEC has played a crucial role in the telecom ecosystem of India in the capacity of the technical wing of DOT. 
and TSC, TSC has been doing a phenomenal contribution to the industrial landscape of India through development of technological standards with regards to telecom network equipment, services, interoperability, etc. Um, we also saw that with the ORAN alliance, um, you know, developing and driving and enforcing the standards to ensure that equipment from multiple vendors interoperate with each other. Do you see India specific standards evolving? How do you see all the stakeholders in telecom value chain, especially the government, working towards a standardized multi vendor ORAN system? Thank you, Dipayan. Uh, well, uh, firstly, I'm really delighted to have been given this opportunity to express my views during this conclave on a very critical topic at a time when uh, we are gearing ourselves up to embark upon the journey of 5G. Now, Open RAN, of course, needs no introduction. We all know it's a general disaggregation of RAN functionality built using open interface specifications between elements instead of proprietary specifications. Traditional RAN on the other side means you have to leverage proprietary embedded fixed and vertically integrated platforms. So clearly open RAN is not a technology per se, it is rather an ongoing shift or a technological trend from traditional RAN architecture that has limitations in the mobile radio access network, which are say vendor lock-in, then uh, it's innovation starved and you need separate software for macro, small cells, 4G, 5G, and what have you. So, see, there are three primary elements in present RAN. We have the RU unit, we have the DU unit, and we have the CU unit. So, it is the interfaces between the RU, DU, and CU, which are the focus of open RAN. Now, open RAN is made possible through standardized open network interfaces defined in a host of SDOs. We have some standards coming from 3GPP, some coming from ORAN Alliance, some coming from IEEE and other SGOs in industry fora. So to cater to all the diverse 5G use cases and operators deployment constraints, the standards define multiple next generation RAN architecture options and the associated open network interfaces. Now, while these options are crucial in making 5G suitable to address all the requirements and challenges of next generation mobile networks, finding out which option fits a particular practical use case is sometimes challenging. This is further exacerbated by the fact that the relevant standards are scattered across multiple SDOs. So while discussing the 5G RAN architectures, we often talk about functional splits. Uh, as opposed to the monolithic architecture in which uh, G node B is defined and often implemented as a single network node. So this joint effort across multiple SDOs, such as 3GPP, ORAN Alliance, Small Cell Forum, CPRI uh, in, uh, uh, Consortium. So this is a testament to the importance of open RAN to the whole industry, which is now enabled through the definition of open standardized network interfaces between the split NG RAN network nodes. But what needs to be seen is that in a price sensitive market like India, telecom companies will have to ensure cost effective and early deployment of services as well as generate additional revenue streams. They need to map the speed of network deployment with an expansion with the growing data consumption to satiate the digital appetite of Indian smartphone users. Then here is where open RAN architecture comes in to picture. We are already between a slew of strategic alliances between various industry players and the TSPs. I do not want to name them, but I find a lot of them already there today on this panel discussion, and I'm sure they would be talking about that. But clearly, some of the most challenging issues about ORAN that come to my mind are multi-vendor management and the ownership of the overall open, open RAN deployment. Then, of course, there are cybersecurity concerns and network performance end to end when we talk about the end to end network performance. Now, first, if I want to uh, address the multi vendor involvement in management, now there are multiple stakeholders here. We have the TSPs, we have the open RAN multiple vendors, then we have the SGOs, we have the industry bodies like uh, IEEE, open RAN, open RAN policy coalition, open networking foundation, and so on. And then on top of all this is the new set of people 
the system integrators, which assume a very critical role in this entire integration work. Now, disaggregation leads to a need for a system integrator. Now, while this flexibility created by disaggregation of the RAM has potential benefits, but it also makes the deployment of the open RAM more complex. Since the different open RAM components may be supplied by different vendors, so how would operators solve compatibility problems that arise during deployment in spite of standardized interfaces being specified? There is a need of information on the practical implications of the disaggregation of the components of the RAM. Now, how difficult will it be to ensure that the components of the open RAM seamlessly operate together? Will testing of open RAM deployment be a time consuming and a complicated process compared to a proprietary closed RAM? These are some of the issues we need to internally deliberate upon. Then, network performance is the performance of open RAM systems likely to be impacted due to a multi vendor environment? Then, as far as the network security and cybersecurity of public key is concerned, Open RAN's ecosystem questions arise like, could Open RAN architecture expose new security vulnerabilities that might not otherwise exist in a more closed architecture? Moreover, the aggregated nature of Open RAN, disaggregated nature of Open RAN, emphasize the importance of adhering to 5G security specifications in both open and closed systems, since security considerations of these components have already been defined in 3 gpp standards. So another interesting aspect that comes to my mind is whether Open RAN is likely to create new opportunities for new entrants in the original equipment manufacturer's market. Would the disaggregated number of Open RAN lower the costs of entry by allowing vendors to develop distinct components of the network, example, hardware, software, silicon, rather than having to build the integrated end-to-end -end system which can be a costly undertaking. Now, another interesting aspect that comes to my mind is, are the potential benefits of open RAN described above available only in a greenfield deployment? Now, while we are certainly progressing on development of open RAN solutions, but still there is a need to address some various technical as well as smooth deployment issues. Now, as head of TC Telecom Engineering Center, which is the DOT's standards body, what comes to my mind is a critical question that considering open RAN is possible through standardized open network interfaces defined in different SGOs, I would say scattered SGOs like 3GPP, ORAN, Alliance, IEEE, and so on. What steps, if any, could be taken by TEC and the Department of Telecom to help resolve standard setting challenges, bolster these efforts, and accelerate the timeline for open RAN standards and specification development? Because frankly, as I've already said, the challenges are multiple. We have multiple stakeholders, then we have TSPs, open RAN vendors, and then we have SIs. We have the maturity of standards also as a big challenge because multi vendor interoperability is still an issue. Even if we add new features in subcomponent, it will require proper testing. Then we have performance and robustness is still under check. And most importantly, there would be additional security overheads, there would be ONM overheads, there would be SI overheads. So considering all this, we need to have, and in fact, to compound these challenges, there would be multiple cloud stack variants if we go for cloud virtual RAN. Then SDOs of open RAN are all scattered. So integrating them and talking and bringing them on a common page would also be a challenge. And the number of open RAN profiles is quite large. How do you test each of these profiles? And how to test with new usage scenarios using subcomponent, using functional splits of 5G RAN. So thus interop and conformance testing and end-to-end -end performance testing does become critical from our angle. But in fact, to address a lot of these issues, even FCC in the US, they have already issued a notice of inquiry in March sometime to seek comments on the open on the status of open RAM, where the technology is today, what steps are required to deploy open RAM networks broadly and at scale, and more importantly, whether the goals and statutory obligations of the government could be fulfilled by making state of art wireless broadband available faster and to more people in additional parts of the country. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, this is what the government wants. So I'm sure. The information that has been asked by FCC in this inquiry 
would enable the government to take a lot of decisions and it would also help the carriers to take informed decision. Maybe the government also needs to float some such paper to all our TSPs and stakeholders. So I'm sure hopefully I have asked the right questions and I'm sure today's discussion amongst the esteemed panelists will help provide answers to some of these, if not all questions that I've asked. And these deliberations will tell us what is the way forward. And let me assure you on part of the government that we are all keen and we are willing to provide every possible help to all the stakeholders and we want to take this journey forward. This is a nascent area, but this is the best time. We have a huge pool of startups. Software is our forte. And if we don't capitalize on this issue, this challenge, it would be missing the bus once again. So with this, I thank once again the organizers and all my esteemed panelists, but I would like to take leave. So hopefully the deliberations would answer some of these questions that I have raised. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Tyagi. Thank you for the wonderful uh, you know, uh, points that you made and the direction for the for this entire panel. I'm I'm sure that you know all 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 of us in the panel will you know take cues from what you just directed and we will uh, you know put forward the answers and our perspectives on these issues. Okay, so um, let's uh, start with uh, 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 Mr. Robert then, uh, uh, and you know we wanted to uh, hear from you that uh, and especially with with uh, with what. Ms. Tyagi just said, um, what are some of the key focus areas that must be considered by industry associations and government to ensure consistent, secure, and, you know, the interoperability of open RAN deployments? Um, your, uh, you know, views from a public policy perspective. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, and that was a great opening asking. So, you know, she, she said, I, she hopes she's asking all the right questions and the answer, the short answer is absolutely. Those, those are all of the right questions. And in fact, um, in thinking about it, you know, one of the biggest, you know, things that need to, uh, we need to work through uh, as industry working with government and government actually can lead here. Uh, and, you know, as what we just heard, uh, you know, DOT, T TCS is leading, um, and India is one of the leaders um, globally in terms of government, is focusing on the, the interoperability. And one of the things that I do is I work very closely with uh, the Telecom Infra Project. And I think many of the my, my colleagues here, um, their companies are members of, of, of TIP. And one of the things that we do, and in partnering with government, I'll, I'll give some concrete examples, um, is testing and validation. It's not just testing for the interoperability, but having a, a the ability to know, have a badge or a, um, uh, you know, the validation so that we know that if you have an RU and it's interoperable with, and there's a DU that it works with the same interface, that they will work together. Because ultimately at the end of the day, there has to be, um, confidence that the operators will be able to have a plug and play by taking advantage of the multi-vendor environment. Um, and, and there are governments around the world, including India, uh, as leaders uh, that are doing this. So, for example, in the United States, um, uh, the National Telecommunications Information Administration is developing a test center, uh, and it's working with TIP and other, uh, uh, you know, private sector-led uh, organizations to build out its testing labs uh, and looking at, you know, what, you know, what do you need to test? How do you test it? But it's a partnership between the, the industry uh, and government. It's the same thing in the, in the UK, setting up their lab they call Sonic. Uh, and, and India with TSC uh, doing the same things. But industry really can lead and needs to lead. And you know, it's the industry labs and the companies coming together. So the tip model for the testing and validation labs are what we call community labs, and they're open to all tip members. Um, it, you know, it may be hosted by one operator, but it's available to others or one vendor. And, and this is, um, you know, I think one of the most important things 
that we as a community can do. Um, uh, industry groups, the associations, um, working together, private sector, the companies, the people, you know, my colleagues here um, on this session, as well as partnering with government. Uh, and again, uh, the, all the right questions, I thought they were terrific. And it is about accelerating the adoption and deployment of open RAN solutions to the advantages of all of the operators and ultimately um, network, you know, subscribers and users. And if that acceleration happens, the economic and social benefits are just going to be enormous. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mr. Mr. Pepper, for that um, you know point of view, and uh, it's it's quite um, um, insightful. Uh, if I can move to um, Mr. Nilesh from uh, Geo, and we all know that Geo has partnered with a with a with a, a multiple um, you know tech providers towards virtualized brand. So, if I may ask you, Milesh, um, what are some of the key benefits that you see telcos can expect from implementing an open RAN architecture, specifically, you know, in terms of lowering the cost of deployments? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, first, I think good evening, everybody, uh, and thanks uh, for having me on this panel for uh, discussion on open RAN. So uh, I think most important thing, architecture of open RAN, well discussed. Tyagi Madam spoke about it. We all understand it very well. Now let's look at what kind of benefit we get out of it. I think most important thing is the architecture clearly, you know, kind of disaggregates the conventional E node B into three parts, and they are all kind of delinked in terms of software and hardware. And all these interfaces are open. Now, this gives a opportunity for many vendors to come up with new hardware in terms of radio, uh, RU, DU, and you know, all, all of them, as seen in many networks, are working together and giving some kind of performance. So the vendor ecosystem is developing, and we have a multi-vendor scenario in the market today which can be leveraged. So we look forward that you know as as the vendor uh, you know number of vendor increase we have a multi vendor scenario the innovation that will happen in terms of all this product uh, will definitely improve overall uh, the product quality and overall performance of radio network in addition to that i think with so many vendors inside Present, we can say, uh, you know, globally, we have four to five vendors who provide RAN. If tomorrow it increases to some 15, 20 vendors, I think uh, the overall TCO uh, of all of all this hardware that is going to come for the operator is going to, you know, reduce. And that will give us a big benefit in terms of, uh, you know, how we deliver cost per GB uh, in our network. So business-wise, I think most important for us is uh, that we deliver uh, GB at the best price. So we feel that with open RAN coming and the ecosystem developing, there will be a cost reduction and overall, uh, you know, cost of uh, GB will reduce. That will benefit not only us, but all our customers. And India demands it. We know the usage, the growth that is happening. And as, uh, as we grow further into 5G space, I think if we can deliver this at a much better price, our end customers will get big benefit out of it. So this is one part which is related to cost where we get a big benefit. I think the second part, if you look at the architecture, I think uh, you, you know uh, there are two, two additional component which used to be there earlier also in 2G, 3G, we used to call a BSC or a radio controller. Today we are calling it a RIC. Now, RIC is not only a kind of uh, a BSC or a RAN uh, controller, but it is something uh, over and above that. It comes with some additional accepts, which gives opportunity to many third party vendors or any expert who can develop the accepts to, to improve the overall performance of the, uh, you know, uh, the network. I think that X app can be run on the network, that freedom is available. And using accepts 
and the features that are available in RIC as well as uh, you know the other component of uh, uh, open RAN architecture, we call it SMO. I think if we can efficiently deliver performance to the customer at a right price, I think nothing like it, which is a which is a which is a big benefit to us. Now, when I talk about uh, you know a RIC performance, our expectation is that we should be able to improve our spectral efficiencies, even if there is an improvement in spectral efficiency using some XAPS uh, application uh, by 10% or 50%, it gives a lot of benefit, not only to our end users, but also we as operator in terms of, uh, you know, how we run our network and how, you know, what kind of impacts we can have on our capexes uh, as we move forward. So spectral efficiency improvements, yes, yes, Dipayan, you want to? Uh, uh, no, I, I just I just wanted to uh, bring Rajesh in here uh, on 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 similarly the uh, the operator side, and uh, just just talk about uh, you know Rajesh. Uh, see, the telecom companies have been bewailing high infrastructure costs for a long time, um, and with five G coming in and the rush to deploy five G equipment, right? Uh, this issue has got even more serious. Um, now, with so many operators keen to accelerate the pace of open RAN developments, as even Nilesh pointed out, do you think it will take precedence when it comes to 5G RAN and VRAN uh, developments? Yeah, thanks, Dipan, and uh, very good evening, all panelists. Uh, it's a million dollar question, Dipan. Uh, because uh, ORAN advantage, you know, it also was seeking same in the 4G. So I think we accelerating our debate to talk about in the 5G. So if a telco point of, you know, as Nilesh was highlighting and other panelists was highlighting that all benefits of ORAN anywhere, are, telcos are looking forward to have been as early as possible. Because if TCO comes in, uh, comes down, there's nothing like it. And uh, infrastructure requirement is much higher in 5G, right? So your benefit will be much accelerated and much scale up but the question is where we stand to today you know uh, if if you see the 5g it's in the architecture it's nsa rsa right so if you are in nsa mode it's uh, has to work with the 4g as well it's in conjunction with the 4g and if you're not adopted the oran in 4g then it's maybe difficult to i mean the complex and challenges to adopt uh, oran in even 5g if you are in a standalone mode, yes, then uh, all it's in your favor. You can go on the directly on the ORAN kind of architecture. But ORAN architecture has to evolve, right? This has to be robust enough to be offer the end user the right services. What we see today, we have all done some kind of proof of concept. We know that some results, but to scale it up and as to go in mass deployment, we see still the challenges are there. The parity of feature, what are the traditional vendors are offering the ORAN has to offer the similar thing the RIC specification which Nilesh was talking is a lot of benefits we can get from the RIC and all that is still need to be you know standardized and has to be free so everybody can adopt it the bigger question is on the you know when the you talk about the traditional vendors how much they are you know pushing it if you see the classical vendors they are not very aggressive on the ORAN architecture and all the trials currently, at least we talk about the Indian market, uh, is generally driven by the currently by the classical traditional vendors. And it's went in mostly on the non ORAN kind of architecture, though, even though I'm talking about the 5G trial, right? So this vendor also has to be really pushed this standards. It should not be left to the only niche vendor which is coming in. And it's, of course, it's maybe they will take time to you know scale up, going for the mass deployment. So question is the on the timing by when this whole ORAN, uh, you know, get really parities to traditional features and the same time, the deployment has to be easy. It has to be plug and play. Because in traditional RAN, we went almost to plug and play today. And uh, very standardized optimization process has been doubled, is automated and all, but see, are ORAN able to offer similar thing? There is still deliberation is on. And when you see the globally deployment, even the 5G, we hardly see the ORAN has been adopted. It's only one or two percent networks are on the ORAN, and that's also maybe the green field operators. But we're talking here the 5G who will go to 4G to 5G, right? That will not a green field. It's maybe overlay kind of, and it will be 
ground fill uh, we can uh, you know categorize under that category in this scenario the oran adoption has bringing a lot of challenges i hope all the vendors will push it hard to adopt in adoption side and especially the big vendors in the classical traditional ran vendors also will accelerate the adoption so that telcos get all this benefits which is when when talk about all the panelists so wish list is there yes wish list is the oran is to be adopted but the timing and the architecture i talk about sa nsa where will stand and how this big traditional vendor also will push it aggressively in the market so it can be easily adopted in the going forward in the 5g network at least which is not happened much in the 4g but at least we should accelerate in the 5g so on this architecture if i can bring in saurav here um see we all know that uh, dell has ongoing work with mavenir vmware uh, for open ran deployments um there's an unveiling of a reference architecture for a wind river studio right um so towards fulfilling this architecture right um how do you see the supply chain of open ran evolve adequately when will the market reach an inflection point you know where you can get this architecture to be adopted in the mainstream absolutely so depend that's a great question and uh, what i'll do is i'll take a leaf from what uh, you know my panelists before me basically mentioned uh, so delish and rajesh they mentioned look one of the often overlooked reasons why um, we are moving towards open ran is also because we want to um, leverage the developments in x86 architecture okay in ran so the network has evolved from monolithic standards as uh, deepa said before us um to something which is exclusively almost software defined um the reasons for doing things software defined is to ensure that you a can automate modularize and more important you scale out scale up and also have a significant amount of uh, robustness and redundancy in the network right so for example we started we all we all started working from home but our telecom networks uh, you know adapted marvelously okay that's all because things are scalable okay and to a lot of to a large extent things at the core are modular we want to uh, the industry also wants to bring that same level of modularity towards the edge which is on the ran the second thing is we are increasing bandwidth continuously so remember when we were in edge we were looking at you know 57 kbps 64 kbps 128 256 now we're looking at uh, you know a gigabit plus so LTA pro is uh, one gig in excess of one gig if you have a lone user under a cell in ideal conditions and 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 uh, you know NR is saying that you know if you're using millimeter wave and you've got a lot of you know you've got a massive slab of spectrum you can go up to 10 gig so mm -hmm. what's really pushing that so what's pushing that is a you have a much bigger carrier you have multiple numerologies okay. and at the same point in time what you also have is a huge amount of math which is allowing you to create a pipe which is robust enough to push that amount of information on that pipe okay now look that math can only be done by 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 hardware right like by cpus so on on the on the on the ue side on the phone side you're having a lot of changes so apple launches new silicon every year um qualcomm does uh, two two uh, flagship chips uh, every year so they've kind of exhausted the uh, the 800 series they're now at 885 now at 888 800 plus so on and so forth so they've exhausted the numbers apple is at a15 already right but do we actually hear from traditional ran vendors hey look we are at this stage of our chip do they ever launch a chip no they don't really right but intel and amd okay they are launching newer accelerators newer chips along with nvidia along with xilinx every 6 months every 8 months so what nilesh also said xaps where do you run that right and you mentioned the topic of inflection so it's not just setting up the network a huge amount of cost comes in from keeping it optimized 
right? We have so many customer complaints. We've got the largest subscriber base next to China, right? I mean, our networks, if I just look at Jio or Vodafone or Airtel, okay, they probably carry more traffic than all three US networks combined, right? And we've got the lowest cost per GB. So uh, the, the question also becomes, how do you optimize the network to cater to so many people despite having so many sites and still you know, keep it profitable for, for network operators? And that can only come through a song, through functionality in the RIC, through XR. And all of that requires what? Compute, right? So what we're trying to do is collaborate with uh, the silicon manufacturers like Intel and AMD, make sure that that hardware runs as beautifully as it does at the core, at the edge, maintaining the same amount of security, robustness, and also ensuring that it works uh, in demanding conditions of the edge where you don't have enough power, you don't have adequate cooling, you have, you have a smaller footprint, it could be just mounted on a pole, it could be exposed to dust, it could be exposed to rain, so on and so forth. So all of those things, okay, need to be perfect. And at the same point in time, you also need more and more compute in order to use AI, ML, you know, instantaneous feedback into the network to make sure, and, and of course, DSS, as, as Nilesh and Rajesh also said, right? You need to optimize spectrum. That's the scarcest and most expensive resource in India. We've got spectrum costs, uh, which are like seven, 10 times of, of global average. So all of those things, okay, need to be optimized. So the inflection will come not just from the, the cost, it will also come from the overall TCO and the overall ecosystem, okay? When that is there, you know, you will have, you'll see um, not just operators embracing this wholeheartedly, but also mainstream vendors, which so far have perhaps not been as forthcoming with open RAN at this point in time, adapting this as well, because that, that really will give it the, the momentum and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the kind of deployment and the attention that it deserves. So here on this note, if I can, um, you know, bring in uh, Red Hat, Comscope, and TCS, uh, especially on the revenue side, right? We, we, um, you know, the the um, the research says that the total cumulative open RAN revenues uh, is projected to approach around ten to fifteen billion dollars by by twenty twenty five, and it, it's actually going to account for around ten percent of the overall revenues. Uh, so. You know, if I can uh, get your independent viewpoint on this particular aspect, that what are those key aspects that you know need to be considered by telcos, infrastructure providers, system integrators, which means the entire value chain, to ensure that we actually get the value of money through an efficient deployment. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, Dipayan. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity and um, good to connect with the esteemed panelists. I just, you know, probably continuing from where, uh, you know, uh, Saurabh left, right? On the point of inflection that we were discussing about, right? We, none of us probably can put a timeline onto it, but I want probably want to go ahead and say that it could be any time in between the next two or three years, right? And, you know, going back to what, what vision and context was said by uh, Deepa ma'am, right? You know, there are a host of these complexities that we all know about, right? This is the, the complex integration between the hardware and software. You know, there is the orchestration challenge, you know, which persists from the legacy and with the coming in of ORAN, you know, and creating that on top of a brownfield environment makes it even more complex. Uh, the other aspect is the operations and maintenance, right? Uh, and I want to allude on another aspect in ONM, apart from the general maintenance and network operations, the other aspect that the industry needs to work around is move away from the hardware centric approach to the software, which will require a paradigm shift in thinking, right? We will need to have a lot of bright minds who are equipped and you know aware of the whole DevOps, CI, CD, and AIML kind of skill sets, right? These are the skill set you wouldn't traditionally associate to be available within an operator, right? And this is something which will be needed to be acquired over time. Uh, the other complex aspect is, you know, with the host of these uh, 
you know, I would call them a consortium of partners coming in together, uh, you know, with networks needing to frequently upgrade and update you know, the life cycle management complexities, you know, seamlessly to move from one, uh, you know, version or generation to the other is something which needs to be looked upon, right? So, if, if you touch upon these four points, I think these are the challenges that are, you know, probably look, looking today are not helping the inflection. The other one is, I think, the commitment of the traditionals, right? So the big operators or the traditional operators, I believe that if you see the recent announcements, they are aligning themselves to the Oren standards, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at, you know, addressing the challenges along with the ecosystem that is present today and also the existing traditional providers aligning themselves to the ORAN standards, right? We, I see the influxion can come in anytime soon, right? We, we, we can see it in next two to three years. Uh, the point is that the inertia is going to be very big initially, but the benefits will outweigh, uh, you know, in, in the longer term. Um, the other aspect I think you were, you know, again, was what are the roles of, you know, the various, you know, telcos, infrastructure providers, and the system integrators. I think telcos will play a very, very pivotal role in this, right? Uh, the whole objective of ORAN is disaggregation, right? But the choice of architecture in this disaggregation still has to be with the telecom operators. They need to be the custodians and, you know, the ones who blueprint it. Otherwise, if we simply think of providing for a single vendor rather than a system integrator to drive this ORAN journey, then we are going back to the times we are trying to get away from, right? Disaggregation means you have a choice of hardware, you have a choice of cloud, you have a choice of radio, so on and so forth, right? So we need operators to play that role of being the custodians and the guardians of their blueprint and not let it away to anybody else. From an infrastructure provider standpoint, I believe I think it changes the paradigm for them. Today, you know, in my assessment, infrastructure companies are doing a lot in terms of setting up the sites and so on and so forth. Tomorrow, they can, you know, in my view, they can don the hat of being a mini SI, right? So they already set up these towers, these sites for the operators. All they can say is that I can go ahead and extend the installation services for the operators, right? I, I can do it myself rather than having any field services team uh, doing so. So they can in fact, mature over time and, and provide those kind of services. Uh, the most important element, of course, is in this, is the system integrator, because they are the ones who are going to stitch this diverse ecosystem to together. They are the ones who are probably going to own this entire architecture. They are the ones who are going to probably solve all those four problems that I stated right at the beginning, right? And the key to this is the operators, the, the, cloud providers, the hardware providers, everybody has to have an automation-led mindset today. With the scale of ORAN, I think the number of sites, you know, we have to move away from the traditional field services so, to a uh, more automation, yeah. one-touch approach. Yeah. So, uh, Abhishek, uh, before before I actually bring in uh, Radha Kant as, uh, as a system integrator, um, let me just take a viewpoint of Amar. Um, so, according to you, Amar, what what do you think are some of the key aspects that, you know, especially an infrastructure provider provider should uh, keep in mind towards uh, an efficiency in deployment? First of all, thank you very much, Dipayan, and to the IMC for having me here on behalf of Comscope. Um, I, we heard from Nilesji about. Uh, you know, the multidisciplinary of the vendor supply base and the supply chain benefits that OpenLAN brings in. And we also heard about uh, the challenges from Rajeshji about the performance expectations from ORAN and operators are looking forward to a robust performance on OpenLAN. Um, some of the critical factors uh, which we, I normally find is not, are not talked about. And I'm going to touch upon some of those factors, which are also very critical for the success and the performance of the open van. And first of all, is the entire site solution piece of the open van. Um, we have talked about the integration of the uh, RU to DU and DU to CU and the RIT. All this is the focus area and rightly so. These are the key components of the open van. But sometimes you forget that um, in the traditional network architecture, which has been deployed so far, the OEMs control the entire site solution 
and they uh, bring that entire site, site solution, which is validated, verified, and it works uh, very well in the field. And they control the entire turnkey solution in most of the networks. And uh, uh, what happens is with Open RAN, uh, this gets uh, you know uh, diversified as well, and uh, operators tend to take uh, that control and they try to you know. Uh, get the sourcing done from multiple point suppliers and these diverse solutions when they are brought together, uh, the performance sometimes is not as per the expectations. So my recommendation and I mean, uh, uh, would be that uh, not only the system integration of the components of the RAN, but also the entire site solution, be it the SFPs, the uh, fiber cables, the backhaul uh, fiber, the front hall fiber, the coaxial cables, uh, even the cabinets, um, and the lightning protection. This entire piece is also a critical factor, and we have seen in open RAN deployments that issues do occur uh, because of the wrongly sized cables, the wrong dimensioning of the cables, the you know the uh, dust and the water ingress, which happens because there's no ownership of the site solution. So that's an area that I would recommend um, to be the focus area of the site uh, of the open RAN as well. The second one, I think Robert mentioned about the testing part of the open RAN. And uh, while it is extremely, extremely important, one part of the testing is also missed out sometimes uh, is the over there testing of particularly of the higher end RAN configurations like massive MIMO. And uh, uh, while we do test uh, the integration of the RAN components, uh, the massive MIMO configuration, the calibration of the massive MIMO and the beam forming RAN. Uh, the RAN radios, as well as on the receiver side, you have the dynamic range of the receiver, the uh, the sensitivity and the selectivity of the receiver, the blocking uh, characteristics of the receiver. In fact, the entire uh, 3DPP conformance testing for the radios, uh, that is sometimes uh, you know needed by the operators, and they are these kind of facilities are not available uh, with the many of the smaller supplier base which is here in the open RAN system. And uh, operators need partners who can extend those kind of facilities as well, so they can verify and test these specs which are quoted by the supplier base. Uh, so that's the second area of uh, area that I think is critical for the success of the open RAN, uh, sometimes overlooked, uh, I would say. And the last piece I would say quickly touch upon is that while the reference architecture is there from tip on the on the radio side and you have the hardware and the software, which is making the radio extremely commoditized and which is what the operators want. But on the other hand, they need to differentiate as well. So how do we differentiate? Uh, the differentiation sometimes comes from the RIC, as uh, Nilesh pointed out, as well as on the BBU, uh, the intelligence, which is there in the software lying mostly in the baseband. But it also comes from the quality of the antennas and the filters that you deploy as part of the radio hardware. And that is something uh, that sometimes gets uh, taken to be for granted. And uh, I would say differentiation of the antennas and filters, which are the building blocks of a good radio architecture and a platform, needs to be taken care of also to uh, make sure that the performance of the open end is as per the desirable levels that the operators want. So I would uh, just uh, rest, uh, I mean, I stop at this point, um, highlighting these three critical factors. Yeah, so um, Radha Kant, uh, you know, you have been a front runner as TCS in, in most of the OR and the deployments that, you know, we, we, we hear of uh, all over. So, um, what are the key aspects you, you keep in mind for an efficient? Hey, thanks. Thanks, Deepai. And uh, it was nice hearing to the panelists. Right context has been set and right questions and uh, right concerns I do see from operator community and infra community as well. So while uh, disintegration, we see it as RU, DUCU, I, I do see in a little different way with the hardware, software, and SI. So hardware is majorly into the uh, uh, RU side, which is the most critical thing while we are uh, working a lot on it, how to make it first time right. There's a lot to learn. And uh, the traditional OEMs, they have definitely, we could see the how much of hard work they have done to come to a stage of making a right hardware in the RU side. A deep engineering is needed. But what has happened, uh, I could uh, see here is with ORAN, we have a lot of uh, flexibility from the operator side on the make versus uh, or build versus buy thing. You can always do uh, uh, a deep engineering on choosing your right bands, 
choosing your right specs in terms of the interference calculations for the band rejections and most importantly on the telemetry side you have the uh, with oran we have all the flexibility of taking the uh, telemetry data from each and every board each and every chip and doing a deep analysis either in the ru itself or bringing it back to the and uh, that makes aiml uh, really usable at the edge and the predictions are i would say no about predictions it's a prediction with a certainty so you can actually find out uh, when the uh, components are going to fail when software is going to degrade so these are the serious capabilities which you see that uh, going to accelerate or bring the value to the uh, oran and uh, this will justify the tcs and the expectations of like whatever uh, the general uh, statement of 30% savings i do see that's happening uh, in terms of the overall thing of course the ru side uh, it has to be fast and right which is very very important to bring the cost uh, nominal and make sure that the oems are making a good amount of profit even while supplying at a moderated rate to the operators the, there is a economy of scale or do you see that around 30000 units the economy of scale where actually you can uh, be economical uh, at, the, uh, at at par with the existing suppliers then comes the du and cu right architecture architecture is very very important uh, where to put it in the remote or it has to be co located with the ru these architectures are not standard these are bespoke this is where the si comes in and uh, we started calling it as a new age si where it is deep engineering of each of the components uh, there is hardware component software component interoperability piece of it yeah i think in 2021 at least oran did a good job in uh, almost stabilizing most of the standard work groups but still some of them are working on the security perspectives yes uh, security side i do see there are a lot of good works are happening around uh, 45 thread elements i do see that uh, oran is working on it these thread elements these thread modelings are pretty much robust and i do see that they are taking the best of 3gpp and other uh, sdos as uh, deepam mom is saying and uh, there are concepts of micro kernels all this stuff is happening in india itself and uh, we are uh, working on it to make sure that uh, the equipments uh, or the components of software or hardware in oran they are pretty much uh, complying to the country's interests and uh, they are being bespoke in every uh, uh, geography so that we the economy of scale and uh, that's uh, i do see uh, things are happening in the right uh, manner uh, speed of innovation we do see uh, is a great thing in oran which is providing in terms of uh, launching the products in the faster pace in making sure that uh, like uh, uh, as nilesh was saying xops and arabs they are actually opening a serious opportunity to whether it's a startup communities under which they were not at all there in the picture this new uh, you know, openings of opportunities for them to really uh, work on a innovative way in uh, energy savings. So we all know that 5G is going to drive more energy. So some people say 20, some people say 30, but irrespective of the number, there is a serious energy consumption is going to increase. And uh, these XAPs and RAPs, uh, right management of it is going to drive it. Uh, from the OS perspective, from the computational perspective, I do see uh, uh, there is a serious uh, smartness is needed on the right uh, way the computations are applied at the S data centers, which is DU and also the, the CU, the centralized one. Uh, the computation not only needs to be lightweighted, it also needs to be uh, uh, less memory consumptions, uh, faster uh, responses with high volume of data, bursty natures. So those are uh, those are the things. These are the design things which uh, each operator would have a different demand or based on the different products. Augmenting them at stupid on the fly. And uh, the, we have seen a lot of flexibility is there in the architecture to uh, get this thing done over the fly. Only thing what cannot be changed is what has done in the, into the hardware. But software wise, it is pretty much allowing many things to be done in the right way. Uh, and uh, making uh, the things in the low cost, making it uh, faster with the high volume and first time, right, is what uh, Ajay Sai need to look into it. 
and uh, new age asai has a serious responsibility to manage the whole life cycle and uh, there is a serious responsibility also lies of how do you manufacture it if it is a uh, going through emc route ems route or it is going to a by captive manufacturing units uh, they do uh, take a lot of uh, a lot of impact on it uh, to be specific the cavity filters in a micro radios they are almost like uh, one fifth of the cost of the radio yeah a yeah right so first time design next well yeah that's 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 quite uh, insightful uh, but unfortunately you know we could have we could have carried this discussion for as long as possible we are just at the top of the hour and um, so before we close right um, if i may go around the table and um, if each one of you have to give a very crisp short um, you know a couple of words answer on uh, in the next 5 years where do you see the maximum number of deploying deployment taking place urban rural greenfield brownfield just take your pick so maybe we we, we start with robert so um it's where data is going to be you know the, the fastest is obviously going to be greenfield we've heard that but it's going to be where you know the the biggest data uh demands are going to come uh, you know, the, the forecast from analysis Mason is, you know, um, you know, traffic in India, which is last year in 2020 was about, uh, 98 exabytes, uh, per month. Um, uh, you know, is going to triple, um, in five years and it's going to be the data demand first on 4G and then migrating into the, the 5G. So that's where it's the, where it's going to happen. And I'd love to hear. From the operators, because you're the ones who are going to be deploying. Yeah. So, uh, Nilesh and Rajesh, what's your pick? Okay. Uh, I think uh, very good question. <laughs> and uh, to start with, I think uh, you know we will have uh, you know there is no answer where we would be after five years, but I can tell you how it is going to happen or what I see as possible, you know, deployment scenarios. So I think initially the commercial deployment may start in some uh, rural part, and uh, with uh, you know uh, you know not a major rollout that can be in coming I will say a year or so, and as we prove that the solution works in terms of performance, in terms of reliability, in terms of stability, efficiency, I think they will start moving from that rural part into into more uh, you know clustered deployment in cities and then it will come to metro so yes definitely a day will come we will see uh, you know a open rand kind of a solution in our metros in india but it will take time and dependencies i have already mentioned thanks so, so rajesh for you it is urban uh, not exactly. Actually, as Nilesh has said, you know, it's a, any new technology you have to really test, uh, you know, properly. And it's a, you are offering services. And as you know, the Indian market, the traffic demand is very high. So from the first day, your network get loaded most of the time. So it will start from the rural, as Nilesh has said, I agree. Yes, of course, Greenfield is the most obvious choice. If you have any Greenfield, new areas, this can go. But it will start from the rural. But once the concept is proven, you realize the benefit. And the one more point I will add, because in the ORAN, if you see, there's a two layer, it's FDD layer and TDD layer. So FDD is the basically coverage layer. So you need to do the first, the coverage layer. So coverage layer is first goes in the new areas, right? TDD is still be seeing there is some challenges here and there. So of course, TDD can be built when the capacity requirement becomes the more and more in those markets. So we can start the coverage layer in those markets, even though maybe when severe urban areas also a little bit, if you need only coverage, you might start the ORAN in certain pockets, certain clusters. But certainly, it could start from the rural, most to us uh, semi-urban, and later on, of course, in maybe two, three years' time, we will see this deployment in ORAN very well accepted in the urban market as well. And we'll, as we talked about all benefit of the talking about the X-Apps, RIC intelligence, all those, because optimization is very critical in the urban market. That once we'll achieve, we will see this deployment in the urban market as well. Great. Uh, Saurav and Abhishek. Saurav, you go first. Absolutely. So I would completely agree with, uh, you know, Nilesh and uh, Rajeshi. Uh, look, uh, if it's purely 5G, 
then you have uh, pretty much coverage only because that's how you start, right? I mean, any new technology is coverage first and then capacity follows. Once uh, demand outpaces whatever capacity you have, you know, from the coverage layer. So yes, absolutely, um, you would basically have it on the FTD piece, okay? Uh, because it's a newer technology, um, people would want to, you know, uh, make sure that it gets proven in areas which have at least some overlapping coverage. That in case you have certain challenges with something brand new, you at least have some overlapping 4G coverage which can take its place, so on and so forth. That's one. And the second aspect is, as 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 Rajeshi was saying, look, you when we talk when we talk about coverage, right? 5G has no coverage even in urban areas. So in certain urban pockets where it's easier to access, maybe you have POCs going in and you know slightly more experimental sites, absolutely. And once you've proven the concept. Look, this is only going to increase because this is exactly what we saw at the core. So we had a monolithic architecture at the core. We had BMSS, the media gateways, so on and so forth. All of those changed to um, commodity hardware purely because it gives you more robustness, modular modularity, so on and so forth. So this is there's nothing going to there's nothing that is going to stop this. And as things improve, it's 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 going to dominate slowly and steadily. I mean, this is where the industry is going to be poised. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Abhishek, your take. I think I think I'm going to subscribe to the views of uh, everybody who's spoken till now, um, and 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 you know, absolutely, it's going to be try and then expand, right? Uh, I think this is the similar philosophy that we saw of network function virtualization on the core side, right? You build a cloud layer and you uh, expand it right to the edge. I think this will be a reverse phenomena that you again build a cloud and move it closer to the core, right? So absolutely the same thing. Uh, you know, obviously the proof will be in the pudding once you deploy it. Um, you know, the inherent uh, technical architecture and commercial benefits have to be met uh, for it to be far out and reaching. And you know, uh, we've seen it happen in the in the core side, and we hopefully will be working as a consortium and an ecosystem to provide that to all the service providers in India. Amar. List what everybody said. Um, so greenfield deployments we have all seen as examples, uh, which are uh, big networks. But uh, for the large legacy operators, um, I think it will be to start with on less demanding parts of the networks, uh, as everybody pointed out, uh, using non-standalone architecture, uh, where they will reform one of the existing 4G layer also to 5G. Um, uh, I mean uh, they will use that uh, 4G layer also on OpenRAN as an anchor layer. So that will be one of the OpenRAN implementations on 4G, 4G side as well uh, to enable 5G on non-standalone. The third area which I think uh, was missed out was the deployment of OpenRAN on the small cell, both on indoor and outdoor small cell, which could be of point of interest for many operators in the beginning phase of the OpenRAN. And the fourth, uh, which I think could be also a possibility is the uh, initial uh, deployment of open RAN in the enterprise networks as well, uh, which can be done by the enterprises themselves or by the operators on behalf of the enterprises, which is also again a self-contained uh, network, so it has less challenges than a normal commercial public network. So these are the areas that I think will start with in the initial right. phase, but it's right. a matter of time uh, before it catches up with the more demanding parts of the network. So Radha Khan, for you, it is brownfield, isn't it? <laughs> it has been brown and green field as well. But I agree mostly with what Amar has mentioned. Uh, enterprise will uh, adopt it faster uh, that time you could see. Uh, why? Because it's again, uh, it's a smaller traffic as, uh, and you have a lot of scopes to really adapt uh, to its stability uh, phases and all. And, uh, uh, and after the uh, confidence is done in, in terms of operability of it, security part of it, I think the deployments will expand uh, irrespective of it is rural or uh, dense urban areas. Perfect, perfect. So we, we are actually around 10 minutes over time. Um, and thank you so much everyone for such an enthralling discussion. Um, thanks again for joining. Um, we would uh, close the panel here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.